All right. Uh, hello, I'm Mark from Sather Powertrain. Thanks for joining us today for this informational webinar. Presenting today will be Sergeant Jared Arbogast of the Iowa Department of Transportation Motor Vehicle Enforcement Division. As we progress through today, feel free to ask any questions you might have using the chat function on the right side of your screen. There is also a document with some great information from the CVSA about this year's annual road check. It is attached to the webinar again on the right side of your screen under the files button. Sergeant Arbogast, thanks for joining us today and I'm gonna go ahead and turn everything over to you. Thank you, good afternoon everybody. So today we're gonna go over a some just some basic information on commercial vehicle stuff, things that we see here in Iowa. But before we get to that, uh, my name is Jar uh, Sergeant Jared Arbogast. I've been with the Iowa DOT Motor Vehicle Enforcement for 12, going on 13 years. Live in North Central Iowa, been up here since I've started. The funny part about me is that I actually came from driving semi and owning my own and operating my own truck and growing up around it as I transitioned into this. So, uh, got married young, got four kids, three of them out of the house, which is awesome. Um, they haven't moved back yet either. That's about as funny as it gets. But uh, with that being said, if you have any questions as we get going on a specific slide, uh, I'm gonna apologize right now. I'll be looking that way because my screens are actually over there, um, but I will try to be looking here. I uh, will try and pay attention to the chat. Hopefully Kelly and Mark can assist with that if I don't see something. But if you have any questions or want to ask something, put it in there. I'll either say, hey, we're going to get to that, or I will ask and try to answer it uh, during that time. Uh, either way, we'll, we'll try and address it. I will tell you this. If I don't know the answer, if it's something that I just, I'd have to look up, I'll get your information and we'll get back to you. So without further ado, we're gonna see if we can share the screen here. Get going. Hopefully everybody can see that. Perfect, here we are. Iowa DOT Motor Vehicle Enforcement, that's who we are. For some of you that don't know much about us, um, our core mission is to promote highway safety through education and enforcement of all Iowa law and federal motor carrier safety uh, regulations. Obviously, we're the only ones in the state of Iowa doing size and weight and uh, travel authority. There's a few uh, troopers that will also do that in the state of Iowa, but kind of what we do. There's 107 of us. Uh, we patrol the Iowa's roadways and we work the way stations. Actually, I do have a backdrop that you can probably tell, but that's where I'm at today. So if you hear a little background noise, uh, I got some of my guys will uh, work training shifts. Uh, subject matter experts in regarding first motor vehicles. What do we do? Enforce all the regulations that pertain to CMDs. Enforce all Iowa, Iowa, Iowa laws and criminal code. Uh, some people don't realize that we do get into that. You know, something interesting. You know, we've had in the last month, I've had guys on felony stops. I've had guys assisting, um, looking, you know, attempt to locate. Uh, all that kind of stuff. And I just like to throw that in because sometimes people don't realize that's what we do. We help the state patrol, we help the county. Uh, if we're close, we'll do that. Provide support to other law enforcement agencies needed, like I just said. Uh, times of natural disaster. As a matter of fact, we just got a nice little attaboy from Madison County during that March 5th tornado. We sent some guys down there to help out. They recognized us for that too. So. You know, it's kind of nice, but it's it's also good that we give back and help other agencies. So just a little little plug about who we are and what we do. We have, like I said, we're not full, but if we, have, if we were full, we'd have 107 of us. So who has to comply with federal regulations? As you guys can see on the screen, all employers, employees, and commercial motor vehicles that transport property, passengers, walk, conducting business in commerce. And the biggest caveat to that, comes on the next slide. Sometimes there's confusion on this, but it talks about a single motor vehicle with a weight or weight rating. So it's either or in interstate and intrastate. So that's a single unit or a combination with a weight or weight rating of 10,000 pounds or more. So your pickup and small trailers crossing state lines are technically in commerce. 
doesn't always have to be. Everybody thinks likes to think CDL at some time, and that's not necessarily the case. And the third one on there talks about the combination vehicle, which would be your uh, CDL, uh, sort of closer to it. Combination vehicle with a combined weight rating of 26,000 pounds or more when the power unit is under 10 pounds in interstate, intrastate commerce. So that's a little bit different because that's intrastate. The vehicle of any size is used to transport hazardous materials and a quantity of requiring placards. So who needs a DOT number? If you're operating across uh, state lines while in commerce, uh, for hire or for private, Sometimes people, when they, because of this, people think, oh, I need a log book when I cross, just because I'm crossing the state lines. That is not the case. We will talk about that here in a little bit. Operating inside the state of Iowa only, only need to get calling for hire. And so there's, like I said, there's certain exemptions we have within the state of Iowa. A lot of people know about them. If you need clarification on that, uh, we do have a, a website you can go to, and it's the Iowa Truck Information Guide. And that's a good one to resource. It's a quick guide instead of having to try and dig through all the code. So, auto service. The state of Iowa exempts the drivers of the following vehicles from the hours of service when operating intrastate. And I probably should have clarified that on that in the beginning. People sometimes get confused interstate and intrastate. Intrastate means you stay in the state. That's how I like to say it so people remember that. Intra in the, so you're staying in Iowa. Interstate is when you're crossing state lines. So this is intra, so we're staying in the state. Public utility trucks, trucks hauling gravel, construction trucks and equipment, trucks moving implements of husbandry, uh, special trucks and trucks under 26,001 pounds. However, as you can see at the bottom of that, it talks about this exemption does not apply to truck tractors or trucks hauling for hire on construction projects. They may still receive the 150 mile radius exemption. And so talking about the 150 mile exemption, people still have to keep track of their time, but they are exempt from logging within that 150 air miles. So, so if, they, if you're staying within 150 air miles, there's a, a, an exemption for that. Some exemptions are totally exempt from the hours of service. 150 mile exemption, just as you don't need a log book. And there's some other ones for farmers and stuff like that, but we're not going to get into that. So if you do have to run a log book, entries must be current to the last change of duty status. Log must be complete with all required information. Um, as you can see on the screen, date, uh, total hours, miles, and a lot of your ELDs will do that nowadays if that's the the case. So if you are running a logbook, you need to retain the previous seven days. So some companies you may only go outside of or need a logbook because you're going outside that 150 or you're going somewhere for the day. And if you certain states are getting real picky on this. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. So what I want to say is if you have to log one day because you're going out and coming back or you're gonna be out and then stay the night and then come back and you have to log, just put on there, local, previous seven days, off weekends, whatever. Just make sure you're doing that so that when you get stopped, if you get stopped, it's already there. You don't have to try and explain yourself. I would like to tell people that because that happens sometimes. Like, well, were your previous seven days? Well, if you can articulate that, well, I, I only run a logbook today, otherwise I don't normally have to. Then, it, oh, okay, makes sense. But if you just do that, it's even easier. It just solidifies what you're saying because you already put the effort in to doing it. So, just a little caveat. This is something I would do if it were me, just because it makes it easy easier for if and if you do get checked. And as you can see, um, fair to do require uh, do status can be placed out of service. Uh, 11 hour driving rule, you may drive 11 hours during a 14 hour period after a 10 hour break. Obviously some of you guys might, might not know, there's some caveats to that. The driver may not drive after the end of 14 second hours without taking first 10 consecutive hours off. But like I said, there's been some, some changes to that as well. Everything counts against the 14 hour rule except, and here's kind of those, those caveats. It says, 
seven hour break or seven plus hours straight in sleeper birth. If utilizing sleeper birth provision, the seven plus hours of sleep must be paired with another off duty or sleeper birth uh, time before the seven hour break to obtain a minimum of a 10 hour break. Now, Mola sounds confusing, and it can be if you don't have a better understanding. Um, basically, you can pair two breaks together, but they have to be qualifying breaks. One of them has to be seven hours in sleep. So that's the basically the caveat for that. And you can extend the 14 hour now um, if you want. But like I said, that gets confusing. 67 hour rule, uh, driver may not drive after completing 70 hours on duty in eight days. If operating intrastate for private care or operating for higher moving construction materials, the driver may be on duty for 70 hours in seven days or 80 hours in eight. Three four hour restart simply is what it is. Three four hour consecutive off duty will restart your seven hours. Thirty minute rest period. Uh, they did change some of that a little bit too, but after eight hours of driving time, you have to have a thirty minute break. Basically, you can't drive eight hours without taking a thirty minute break. That's really what that means. But now, if you're on duty but you drive six hours and then you stop and get fuel, that that counts. So been kind with on duty, off duty, or super bird. So that's kind of a nice change that just happened in the last year or two. Uh, not required for OD loads, uh, obviously permitted loads, obviously the 150 air mile and the livestock hours. You don't even have to have a permit in Iowa to haul an egg, uh, like a tractor and stuff like that, if you're on anything but the interstate. And some people don't realize that. Now, if it's not an implement of husbandry, um, there's some more caveats to that. So, if you have a permit for the width, um, there's, there's, there's a provision in there about talking about domicile, not domicile, excuse me, um, divisible loads. Has to, if it takes more than eight hours, you know, you can get a permit, this and that. Any more. Like you see the big combines, tractors that already have the duels on them, they can do that. And they get a permit for that um, as long as the, the permit is accurate. But like I said, depending on what you're doing, you may not even need a permit unless you're on the interstate with, if you're talking specifically with uh, tractors and implements that was very. So, but the other thing you have to remember is that sometimes when we're talking about that, it by definition has to meet in the Implement of husbandry, and if it's used on a construction site, you may not always um, meet that definition. Just so understand, you still might need a permit, and a lot of people I know still get them when, it's, when they're doing construction or hauling. Even if you're hauling it for hire in Iowa, you don't need, like if you're picking up a John Deere tractor or a Case International tractor in Jackson or uh, Minnesota or Waterloo, Iowa, those seem to be the two hot biggest ones around here. Um, or Ziegler Cap for that matter. You know, you can, you don't have to have a permit if you're not on the interstate and it's an independent Still some requirements you have to meet, but I hope that answers your question. If not, use the comments section. Cargo securement means. Uh, preventing cargo from leaking, spilling, blowing, and falling. Obviously, you can see the picture on there. That one, one on the lower left of my screen is kind of funny. The strap's doing a lot with that pile of dirt. Maybe comical. Front end structures must be adequate strength. Blocking, bracing, shoring bars, tie downs. The front end structures, what you mean is you can't just have some old rusty, almost ready to fall off piece that you're putting something against and expect that to count. Uh, prevents against sifting load, as you can see in the pictures. Contained and immobilized secured upon within the vehicle to such an extent that the vehicle stability or maneuverability is adversely affected. So, obviously, there's some there's certain things of lightweight cargo that we'll see in your UPS and FedEx, uh, you know, your door to door trucks and stuff like that. And, you know, obviously, that most of that lightweight stuff's not adversely going to affect it. So, there's, it's, there's a little caveat to that. Hazardous materials must always be secured. This is a good one. 
So you see the middle one, how they're all chained together? They're least secured. The one on the bottom left, just hanging out, thrown in the back of a pickup truck or in the, on the flatbed of a truck or in the trailer, it has to have its own form of securement. The bottom right one where it's, down, it's mounted in something, that would work too, because it's not going to go anywhere. So, like if you have also the truck, service truck, I like to think of as obviously, they have the doors on the side. If you open it up, well, yeah, it's inside there, but it can't be moving around in there. It still has to have its own form of securement in there. So, make sure if you have gas cans, diesel, uh, the other one is the propane torches, acetylene, oxygen, all that good stuff. You need to make sure that's secure. And I think most people are pretty good about that, but it's something that we do see still quite, quite regularly that people just forget to. And one, it is not a service, whether you get a ticket or not, that's up to the officer, but it is not a service condition, which is never a good thing to be put on an inspection document. Even as minor as it might be, a loose two gallon gas can, it's out of service. So something to be thinking about. Have our requirements, uh, cargo is to be secured. Um, according to the weight of the cargo and the length of the cargo, could be either one or both. Minimum tie downs by weight, determined by weight of cargo, and working load limit of tie down. This is always a good topic to go over. Uh, the aggregate working load limit time must be half the weight of the cargo being secured. And as you can see the example on there, 24,000 pounds must be secured using tie downs with an aggregate working load limit of 12,000 pounds or more. And identify the working load limit. And this is a good picture because it shows the working load limit, what is stamped on there. And that's what we go by. So here's another good one. Talks about the binder, the chain, the hook, unmarked stake pocket. What is the working load limit? Obviously a stake pocket doesn't have one, so we don't know. But the lowest working load limit in that combination of you know chain, hook, and the binder that's what you're going to get. So it's pretty simple to figure out. Well, where it gets a little bit confusing is when you only get half of it. And I believe there's some slides coming up that will talk about that. So half the working load of the assembly, if the tie-down goes from an anchor point on the cargo to an anchor point on the vehicle. So direct to cargo, set, set, attached to the same side of the trailer. So as you see those pictures there, Obviously, it goes up, one down, and then on the lower right-hand side, it's the same thing. So you only actually get half the working load limit of the weakest link in that setup is, is what you will get. So those two chains on the back there, basically, if they're the same binder and then they all have to both have the same, the weakest link is the, for example, is the binder, you're going to get the full working load limit, you just think about the full working load limit of one of them because you're only getting to get half for each. Does that make sense? Because you're only getting a half for the one on the right, only going to get half for one on the left. Same with the picture on the left. It goes up one side, hooks to the side of the machine, and then back down the same side. You're only going to get half the working load limit. So if the binder, for simple math, was 6,000 pounds, and that was the weakest link in the chain and the binder and the hook set up, you're only going to get 3,000. So we talk about full working load limit. Uh, tie down goes from an anchor point on the vehicle over, through, or around the cargo to the second anchor on the opposite side of the vehicle. So it has to go up over to the opposite side. So as you can see by the example, there's the straps are from one side to the other. Now if you're using a chain, and so let's say it's a piece of equipment, and the requirements are the hydraulic piece has to be lowered and set down. You can put a chain across all the way from side to side. And you're going to get full working load limit on that, which is nice because that helps get you to that half the working load limit that you need of the aggregate weight of the vehicle. Even though you can only, you still have to have all four corners secured and you only get half for each one of them. So that's where it is nice and it helps bump that up quicker because you're getting the full working load limit out of it. So, securing by length. In addition to cargo gearing, there's a minimum number of tie-downs according to cargo length. It is possible to have adequate secured weight, but not, not, but not length? Yeah, sure is. One tie-down for every 10 feet of cargo or a fraction thereof. 
and that one is if blocked. So the little diagram is showing, obviously you got a header board right there, and this is, is if it was blocked. So then here's one, minimum number of tie downs if not blocked. One tie down if less than five feet in length and less than 1,100 pounds. Two tie downs if less than five, five feet or less than length, but more than 1,100 pounds. So longer than five feet, but less than 10 feet, your respective weight, longer than 10 feet, there must, there shall be two tie downs in the first 10 feet and one tie down for every 10 feet or fraction of 10 feet after that. So basically, if you don't have a header board, the first two, you need to have two straps in the front two, uh, for 10 feet and then one thereafter if it's not blocked. Usually, have, usually what happens. So just you guys can see that. Talks about five foot or less and one hundred pounds or less. Tie down device damage. As you can see, <laughs> no damage or weakening that it adversely affects performance or working load limit, no cracks, cuts, or adversely affects the strength, and only approved repairs. So as you can see, all of those are issues, depending on if that's a two inch or four inch strap. Uh, there's a chart we have, I think four inch strap is three quarters of an inch. So three inches half, and then goes down to a quarter uh, in a two inch strap. And it can be one on this side, one on the other side, one on the other side, and they all can get added together. So make sure you have good straps. And on the right, the cold shut and the, the tie there, those are not acceptable. You have to have a, a clevis with a, with a pin to fix the chain. That is the proper way to fix that. Even though you put a cold, I mean, even if you weld that, it is not acceptable. Anchor point damage. Obviously, we have seen this multiple times. You can see by the picture on the, the right. Uh, no damage or weakening. Obviously, we don't want that. No crash damage that adversely affects the strength. So, obviously, it's been cracked. They're pulling up on it. That's, that's not good. Or if it's, obviously, that's aluminum. Sometimes we've had things that are so rusted that they're almost pulling away from where they're anchored to. So make sure that what you're hauling on is in working, good, good working condition as well, because that obviously can be an issue. Tie downs must be adjustable. I always like this one. I always think of the old uh, the farmer who drives the skid loader up on the, the trailer, hooks to chat, and he's got the two hooks mounted to the bucket, slaps two chains on it, backs it up tight, and puts a binder on the back. Seems like a good idea. I'm secure, but it's technically not legal. They need to be adjustable. And this is it's actually in the code. Obviously, it's a, if it's in a qualifying uh, commercial vehicle that is subject to the regulations. So, you know, just throwing that out there, too. The Iowa code is a little bit different in that regard. Um, it just basically has to be secured. But, obviously, if it's uh, in commerce... Uh, falls into the, you know, what we talked about the very first, second, third slide there. It has to, every, every securement has to be adjustable. And that just shows if you're what the image to chain looked around there. So, so machines weighing 10,000 pounds or less must have at least one tie down them on the front and one on the rear to prevent forward, rearward, lateral, and vertical movement. Pretty self explanatory. Heavy equipment. The rules in this section apply to the transportation of heavy vehicles, equipment, and machinery which operates on wheels or tracks such as front end loaded bulldozers, tractors, and shovels, and which individually weigh 10,000 pounds or more. Basically, if it's over 10,000 pounds, you have to abide by this. It's got to have um, accessory equipment such as hydraulic shovels that do not have manufacturing lock pins installed in place and for a moment must be completely lowered and secured to the vehicle. What that means is it has to be secured to the deck, so whatever it's on. Obviously, it's in that, like that specific one right there. I get it, it's really not going to go high enough to go anywhere, but by code, it has to be secured. And that's what I was talking about. That's one of those instances where you could put the chain all the way up over and through to the other side, and you get full working load limit, even though, because the vehicle is, the machine's over 10, you get to have all four 
corners. So articulated vehicles shall be strained in a manner that prevents articulating while in transit. So a lot of times there's a pin for this. If not, it needs to be chained. In addition, that's just going forward uh, movement in the lateral, forward, rearward, and vertical direction using your four tight outs. You've heard me say that a couple times now. This is where it actually is. Uh, it says we have to do that. So each of the tiles must be fixed or close to a crack to the front or rear of the vehicle or mounting points on the vehicle that have been specifically designed for that purpose. So as you can see, that's not verbatim what the code says, but it's 393. Uh, 130. If anybody ever wanted to look it up. Anybody have any questions before we can move on to the distracted driving part of it? I don't see anything else in the chat over there. Usually loads of camera gets, depending on what kind of audience we have here. Um, sometimes it gets to be interesting. Uh, just because there's a lot of what a, what, what that. Basically, and the other, here's the other thing. If you have a bad strap, it used to be we, years ago, we wouldn't count it or put it down as a violation. The problem is, if that's a strap that you might use again, that's the argument as well. What if they use it and now it's required the next time? We need to let them know and it needs to be documented because it's a bad strap. Or it has a cut that's too big or something like that. So if you have straps with these shoes, just don't use them. Um, get new ones. Same with the chains. Uh, repair them the, the proper way so that you don't have issues um, going forward. So that's just a couple of more talking points and things that we, we see a lot out here when it comes to that kind of stuff. I uh, didn't go over a lot of vehicle stuff. That's all pretty self-explanatory. It's amazing how many uh, loose wheel fasteners we still find, uh, broken rims. So make sure you guys are doing a good pre-trip. I can't stress that enough. Like I said, I used to drive. One of the biggest things I, 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 I did a really good job of when I did that, when I was in that profession, was making sure before I took off, you know, check my lights, kick my tires, check, you know, the lug nuts. Just a good walk around, you can see a lot. Even just looking at your brake shoes and brake drums on the back side, you can see, you know, is the gap very big or small? You know, obviously, we're a lot of vehicles with this brakes now, if it's not shiny, it's probably not working. So, outrigger boards, when empty, secure as general light cargo required? Yes, you still have to secure uh, the boards as, as general. Um, I guess outrigger boards, I'm assuming kind of like dunnage, that's what I would say. Um, that's another form of that. They still have to be secured. That is correct. Especially if it's just the the boards, you know, the things that flip out and then you put the boards on. Yes, obviously they need, they need to be secured. I hope that answered your question. Another little caveat to that, because I said it, I was talking about dunnage and stuff like that. First, if you guys got a better haul on uh, the bigger loads. If you have that center section and like your, your, your drop decks and all that good stuff, make sure everything is down inside that and can't actually be coming out. Uh, don't just throw chains on, you know, the other day I was going down the road and I saw somebody said chains just laying on the deck. No, they can obviously fly off and slide off unless they're secure. So just a little, like I said, caveat to that. So, uh, distracted driving. Obviously, I'm not going to lie, Iowa law is, still makes this kind of tough for us to actually write good citations and enforce really well. Um, we've done some projects where we've had some success, but it takes a lot of time, effort, and energy, and we're still going to keep doing it uh, because obviously you guys can see it out there if you're driving anything of size where you have a better, uh, you know, the vision down into a vehicle. And even when you're not, look how many people are still talking and texting and, and at, at a stoplight, and it's, it's bad. We're uh, unfortunately uh, having a lot of fatalities out on Iowa's roads, and our numbers are already pretty high this year. So, you know, something to uh, to think about. Things we're going to talk about here. So, no driver shall engage in texting while driving. No motor vehicle shall allow or require its drivers to engage in texting while driving. 
So texting while stopped at a run, stop sign, or traffic jam is prohibited. Uh, drivers may engage in a text or message or an emergency situation provided they can do so, so safely and in order to communicate with law enforcement or other emergency services. So drivers may engage in text message when the CMB is safely parked off the roadway. A lot of this is, so like I, before I got to this slide, the federal code and for CMBs is definitely better than Iowa's current state state law. But, and obviously we're, we use that one uh, quite a bit when it comes to commercial vehicles. But what I was saying was a lot of times everybody gets mad. Uh, you know, we, we stop a lot of you guys, obviously, that are driving these big trucks and then your complaints are, hey, what about this car? And I agree. It's just harder to enforce. Uh, I know us, the state patrol, your counties, like I said, it, it's just tough just because the way our state law is written. But obviously, you guys driving commercial vehicles and gals should make sure you're not doing that. And the difference also still with Iowa is you can be on the phone in the car. Commercial vehicles, you can't have the phone up to your ear. It has to be hands free. And so that is also still a big difference between the federal code and the Iowa code. So this is obviously federal what we're talking about. The driver shall use their hands to make a phone call or to speak on the phone with the one button to make a call. The motor carrier shall allow or require service to engage talking on the phone while driving, engaging on a phone call while at red light, stop sign traffic, change hood, may engage in talking on the phone in an emergency situation provided uh, it's safe to do so. And it talks about sibling parts. So here's some of the penalties for talking and texting while driving a commercial motor vehicle. Moving violation and a fine of 135.50. That's Iowa, and a civil penalty up to 2,750 dollars. It is considered a major moving violation, and if anybody understands that, the insurance does not like that, so that's why it's it is a big deal. Uh, second conviction results in 60-day qualification disqualification of CDL privileges. That's big, obviously, because that's that's two months. You know, somebody that's driving for a living, that's, that's verbal. Um, motor carrier subject to fines as well, up to 11000 I haven't heard of, I haven't looked into it. I don't know. I couldn't say how many of that's, that's happened. I don't know. So, what does cell phone use attribute to? All these things here. Um, proper lane changes, signaling violations, following too close, minor speeding, careless driving, and... You know, I'm also a defensive driving uh, instructor, and it's been said, and it is true, We have, some of us think we can multitask really well, when in actuality, we can't. Because once we take our eyes off of the road, to the radio, to our cell phone, to something else, our mind goes there. And honestly, even just talking on the phone, whether it's in free or not, is actually just as much distracting. Even though, by law, we can do that, it is actually you are just as distracted as when you're texting and because your mind's not where it's supposed to be. So, you know, just think about that. Some of the indicators of distract driving. Rumble strips, obviously there was a big dead giveaway. In weaving in out of lanes, fair to signal on turns and lane changes, varying speeds, look at the driver's position through the window and our rear view vision mirrors, constantly looking down at the phone. Uh, keep your distance, don't follow too closely. Yeah, and honestly, you know how I get a lot of them that I find driving, even in CMVs especially? They don't even realize I'm beside them and I'm sitting there looking at them in the mirror because they're so worried about what's kind of the conversation and looking forward to the, they think they're multitasking really well. They forget about somebody coming up beside them, especially on the interstate. So it's, it's interesting. All right, here. What can I do? Yep. Call law enforcement. Be ready to provide a, a good description and direction of travel. Try to get a license plate, state number, if you can, and do so safely. The law allows for emergency vehicles, emergency use of cell phones, but only do this one is safe for you. Don't be part of the problem. Obviously, it's talking about us because, yeah, we're human. We could be just as guilty, that's for sure. It says, well, what about law enforcement? So, MBE squad cars, 
kind of a cool thing. We've actually had it for probably six years, seven years now. Uh, that computer sitting there and all that good other equipment we have in there is really nice to have. However, once we hit 15 miles an hour, that computer screen, uh, there's very few functions that we can do. We can't uh, check email. We can't do um, can't do anything on it, to be very honest with you. There's one screen. It's a law enforcement screen that dispatch has that they can pin something, and we have a hot button. Uh, where we can just acknowledge it or they can pin it to see maybe we're not from the, like I'm, I work in the state, maybe there's an incident out in the middle of nowhere, rural Iowa, and I'm still one of the closest cars, and when we respond, they can pin it, and then I can drive towards it. So it is a really cool tool. Uh, state Patrol, I think, just implemented or has something similar. Ours is called Archangel, and so, you know, it, you sometimes might see the computer screen up, but all it is is it's basically like a GPS screen um, because we can see where other officers are and see the, the roads and you know, depending on how they have their own specific setup where they have county lines, lines showing on it or whatever. It's basically similar to the GPS screen. So, yeah, it's, it's just kind of cool. And we were one of the first ones in the state of Iowa to do it, and we're still one of the very few agencies unfortunately that has implemented it but our chief was uh ahead of the game and we just you know we've gotten used to it it's, it's actually really nice it keeps you know like i said we're human too and you hear that ding on that phone and you want to look same with email ding you know and uh in my position within motor vehicle enforcement i get a lot it's like man i like to stay on top of that stuff but it's nice i know it ain't gonna pop up anyway so it's no sense in opening and even trying to look so kind of cool and cell phones, while we're on that subject, you can do that. iPhones, Androids, they are as all a setting or an app that you can get so that when you're driving, you can turn it on and then you either silence them or say it'll return like if somebody texts you, it will say, driving, I will talk to you later or contact you later or whatever message you put in there. But it basically lets the person know that you are driving when you get a text. So if you haven't checked into that, um, I don't know all of them, but I know my phone has it, and you can you can set it up whatever style of phone you have. Obviously, it's computer software. Basically, everything I just talked about. Armstead tamper proof has been proven to re reduce accidents and unsafe operation. So obviously, you got to pay attention to it. So. You guys, any questions on that? We're gonna talk a little bit more about some of this. Uh, the major causes of accidents is obviously some distracted driving. We've got some videos that are in play here for you. Some of them are interesting. I will try and give you uh, where to look so you don't miss it when we play the video because some of them are uh, happen fairly quick. But I will point them out. Obviously this is not a good situation. As you can see, it's on an Iowa roadway. So, following too close. Uh, last year, I think we had 27, I want to say, don't quote me on that, uh, snow plows hit. Obviously, this isn't during the wintertime the way it looks to me, but I see the orange truck and it makes me think of that. And that's why, especially, uh, we need to make sure you have a safe, maintain a safe following distance. And, you know, in a truck, give yourself that extra time. Uh, you got a lot more weight going on, or if you're just pulling the pickup and trailer, understand hopefully your trailer brakes are working like they're supposed to be, um, because it's all going to, you know, contribute if you're following too close or going too fast. Obviously, distracted driving, that is a horrible picture. But alcohol, substance abuse. I was just reading something, oh, actually earlier today that the Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance had put out. And half of the vehicles or impairment or drug related stuff that or items that we've taken out of vehicles in the last uh, few years, it's about fifty percent of it is uh, marijuana. Um, obviously, we still have the other the alcohol. You have some of that, uh, your meth, cocaine, uh, and all of that kind of stuff. It's all there, but 
prevalent marijuana has definitely has been on the rise. Obviously, in some states legalizing it, since it's not in a commercial vehicle, there's still as of right now, there's uh, zero tolerance. So you you want to make sure you're not doing that, partaking in that. If you're going to get behind the old CBD or any of it, for that matter, in my opinion. Obviously, speed. Quite a picture there. <clears throat> you know, what we don't talk about sometimes is speed in Iowa is all the wind we've had, even this spring, has been horrible. How many trucks we've had blown over. And sometimes, you know, if we slow down, you can still go and you know even if you're still maintaining that minimum speed it would be a less chance of getting blown over but not necessarily but you know just something to think about you know slow it down out there faulty equipment i told you we've been finding different things here lately and there's a, a good good picture of one i don't know where that picture is at though that's the funny part i don't know if that's in the dt shed or just a picture somebody found but up here at the North Iowa scale, we actually had something similar to that not just too long ago. Okay, so here's where the video starts. When I, when I push the play button, uh, if you think you guys can see my cursor on the screen, this is one of our Tahoes right here. Watch the car that comes flying up and cuts it off. Guardrail. And as you can see, that's just going to make a mess there. So if the wind caused the accident, do you cite the driver? Honestly, um, it depends. To be very honest with you, there's nothing that says they can't. Um, especially if you look in one of the federal codes talks about um, the safety of others in driving commercial vehicle. 39214 is actually the code uh, where it says they shouldn't be out if it's dangerous. Obviously, what constitutes dangerous? Obviously, it's arguable. Do I think that most people get a citation for that? I would say no. However, most of the time in Iowa is we just assist in uh, with accidents. The actual the Iowa State Patrol or your county deputies actually do the accident reports. Since we work for the DOT and that's where the reports go, we don't do them. Doesn't make sense to me, but that's the way we've always done it. Uh, bad accidents, we do, like I said, we do assist and do the commercial vehicle side of it, the inspection and all that kind of stuff. But Will we write tickets for uh, certain things that we find it? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Uh, it's, it's strictly be up to the, um, the the officer at that time. But I would like to say most time that's probably not. Uh, so this one, when it starts playing, you're going to see an RV come into the screen and watch that. Right there it is. Little caveat to this, I don't know how many people have the cameras. Obviously, this, this um, company has them on the driver and on the front windshield. 
I tell you what, they've been pretty handy when the driver, commercial vehicle driver says, hey, they, they cut me off or this, this did happen, that happened, and they can show us the video. It's, wow, because let's be real, a lot of times it's not the CMV driver's fault, and we understand that. I want you guys to understand that too. Um, but man, holy smokes, that the videos that we have nowadays with some of them are incredible, and they, they've done a nice job of helping us um, make it a lot quicker um, figuring out what, what actually happened and you know, we have to go to the statements and whatnot. So. I know they're expensive. I'm not saying go out and do it. I'm not advocating for them. I'm just saying how nice they are. Uh, this one's going to be in the over here in this lane. It's going to be the little cards going to be coming rather fast. I believe it's a little burgundy car or orange or something like that. Right there. And as much as I don't like the safety barriers where they're placed uh, or the, out there, they do work. I mean, you see it right there. Uh, that probably would have gotten hit by that semi had that been just not been there to catch that car. So, I'm do I know what happened there? No, I just I don't know anything specifically really about these videos other than uh, they're an island. Huh, and this one is, and this is what just don't be this person. And so that will happen to me. We're going to watch a, it's about an eight, nine minute video here. I got to click off the screen, click on the next one. So it'll be just a little bit of hesitation here. Uh, don't go anywhere. Just got to pull the other screen up. Tuesday was another example where someone's killed on our roads uh, for no reason other than someone else's poor choice to make that phone more important than driving. Uh, we shouldn't need a law to tell us to pay attention while driving. We should just be paying attention while driving because we know it's the right thing to do. And had that happened on Tuesday afternoon, there's no doubt in my mind that Mr. Bursick would have been home. He was stopped at a stoplight. I hit him when I was going 63 miles an hour. It hit so hard. My truck went on top of this car. I couldn't steer. I couldn't. The brakes didn't do anything. I couldn't do anything. I've heard the reports that the fire department took hours to get him extracted from the vehicle. That is a haunting image in my mind that I think about all the time. We'll never get to see our dad again. And it's all because of the eight seconds that Sam decided to look at his phone. Robert and I were married on March 23rd of 2013, and he died just short of our five-year anniversary. He made people feel very welcomed. He was always kind of the life of the party. Um, he was never afraid to laugh at his own jokes. He really cared about humanity, the environment. Um, I, I have two stepkids who are older, and when we were married, he really wanted to have another child, and of course I did too. Um, so Ian was born in 2011, and he just thought it was the best thing, even though he was an older father. He just looked at it like, how lucky am I to be able to get to do this again? He's missed out on so much. He's, he's missed out on his daughter's wedding. He 
She's missed out on the birth of his grandson. She's missed out on his son who graduated from college. And Ian has missed, um, missed out on that growing up and sharing a lot of those things with Rob that you hope every kid and father get to do. Um, and he missed out simply on, you know, somebody's poor choice. It's been difficult. He misses his dad a lot. Uh, my dad was the most energetic, outgoing, loving, funny guy almost anyone has ever met. Um, he was that guy that just absolutely lights up a room when he steps into it. The big thing that we were planning when my dad was killed uh, was my wedding. He was going to walk me down the aisle. So uh, my uncle Paul, my dad's brother, had to walk me down the aisle because my dad wasn't there. My son was born in June of 2018. I can only imagine what an amazing grandpa he would have been. I feel devastated for my little brother Ian. I feel devastated for my brother Colin. I feel so sad for my son that he never got to meet him and have him as a grandpa. I feel so horrible for my stepmom. It's just so hard to think about the fact that he doesn't get to be here for the world and continue making an impact. The day of the crash, I was leaving my second to last stop. I, was, I got on Highway 36 going east towards Wisconsin. And meanwhile, while I was driving, I got a message about a house that my girlfriend at the time was looking at. I pulled out my phone to, to look at it and see what she was talking about. I thought it would be fine. I thought nothing will happen. During those eight seconds, I, the time went by so fast. I traveled a lot farther than I ever thought I would have. I looked up just before I hit the vehicle, and the truck went right on top of his car that he had. I pushed him all the way through the intersection. And I got out of the truck as fast as I could, and I ran back to the car. By then, it, would, it sank in fully that it was too late. When I found out about Rob's passing, we were actually going through a very difficult time. My son was in Children's Hospital, and he had a bad eye infection. He was getting treated for that, and uh, a nurse came into the room, and she had just a grave look on her face. And then a state trooper came over to me and sat me down in a chair and, and told me the news. And I remember, you know, maybe about 20 seconds of just numb, um, staring at him. And then having to go into the next room and tell my son that his father was killed in an accident. He immediately started crying. And the first thing he asked me is, will I be able to get a new dad? And that was... That was devastating. When I think about Mr. Bursick, I think about his family. I think about him being a dad. I think about him being a professor. I think about his, his greenhouse that he had, which was his business. I think about his his kids. You You definitely don't want to be that person that takes somebody else's life. You don't want to go to jail over it. You don't want to hurt your own family and their family. At the time of the crash, I was a single dad raising a young son and a young daughter. Over the time I've been in jail, my children have missed out on me being there for Christmas, for Thanksgiving, for their Christmas concert. And they've just missed out on me being there every day as I was before. I know in the future my family will, will get to have me back for for holidays. But Mr. Bursick's family won't have him back for any future holidays. It's heartbreaking to know that that happened.
to know that I caused that. To know that it's my fault, that they won't get to enjoy another holiday with him. I can't say I'm sorry enough. I can't tell you how bad I feel knowing that you have to grow up without your father. I wish I could take it all back. I wish I could change the events. Getting one text and checking one Zillow link led to an entire life of regret, remorse, sadness, heartbreak. I don't think drivers realize how long they're actually looking at their phone, not paying attention to the road. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you wear a suit and tie. It doesn't matter if you wear jeans and boots. It doesn't matter what you do for a job. This can happen to anybody. All it takes is one poor decision. Every time I hop in my car, I see people driving distracted. And I mean, I just want to stop the person and shake them and tell them, do you have any idea what what you're doing right now did to my family? Do you have any idea what that did to my family and what you could do to someone else's? My dad left me a voicemail updating me on my brother Ian's condition uh, at Children's Hospital the day that the crash happened. So I just wanted to let you know, you have a good day, I'll talk to you later, I'll give you five. You know, I mean, we have the memories, yes, but we'll never get to see your dad again. And it's all because of the eight seconds that Sam decided to look at his soul. Pretty humbling video, that's for sure. Kind of puts in perspective how long eight seconds is. Anybody have any questions as we keep going here? We'll be wrapping it up here shortly. We're going to touch on one more thing, unless somebody has other hot topic ideas they want to put in the chat. Um, when we get after this next session, I'll ask Mark to come back on and if he has any questions or wants me to. Uh, address something that we didn't talk about. We can sure do that. I would use Team Motor Vehicle Enforcement. Uh, we teamed up with Truckers Against Trafficking yeah, about 10 years ago already. And we do a lot of industry outreach. Uh, so if you guys ever want us to come do a presentation on that, we're going to talk a little bit on a couple slides here. Uh, what is it? Involves exploitation of people for the purpose of commercial sex or forced labor. Um, FBI stings operations from 2003 have recovered children as young as 13 that were being uh, prostitutes as truck stops, as well as adults who've been prostituted. There's also a lot of labor trafficking going on that is kind of, nobody talks about that one because it doesn't seem like it's as, they don't think it's as prevalent, but it really is. So what is, what is the mission? Uh, when we do an inspection, we, bottom of our inspection, some of you might have stopped for us and we'll see there's a wallet card attachment to the bottom of it. It just has some information on, you know, human trafficking, and what, what is the mission for TAT? We seek to educate, equip, empower, and immobilize members of the trucking industry, or whatever industry, we always, trucking, because trucking is trafficking, but any industry, it doesn't matter, um, to combat human trafficking as part of their regular jobs. Uh, we'll do, we'll be at Walcott, we'll be at State Fair, social media, uh, training DVDs, we've done, we got uh, PowerPoint, we're training all 2,500 uh, DOT employees, as we speak, we're working on that. That's something we have going on here, too. Uh, kind of what is our goal? Uh, partner with Law Enforcement Task goal is to partner, and they have with us, and they're in 42 states or something like that now. Uh, partner with Law Enforcement and the industry to facilitate the investigation of human trafficking, uh, the calls and the tips that might come in. Uh, we have what we call the Iowa DOT model, and uh, that's what has been adopted uh, nationally by, like I said, 40 some other states at this point, so it's, it's a good deal. So what's our goal? Put a wallet card in the hands of every driver in America so that they, when they see a minor working a lot, a suspect pimp patrol or anything else they believe may be human trafficking, they call the number 888-373-7888 and report what they know. 
and might need, lead, something might not lead to anything, but it's kind of like with anything, you like to say, there's, well, if you see something, say something, um, because all the information we can get, uh, sure helps. This is a picture of the wallet card. Uh, we have these at all our scale facilities, and like I said, that's also what is on the, the bottom of our, uh, inspection. Backside talks to you, see some things to look for. I'll let you guys read through that if you want. There's questions to ask, all that kind of stuff. If somebody wants me to send some of these, uh, I can put my uh, email in the box over here or get a hold of uh, Mark and they can get you my information as well. Just talked about some of the, the numbers. 350 potential kids human trafficking from these calls. You know, you think 350, that's it. Well, it's actually a lot. And that's, that's, that actually, you know, people have made the choice to call. And there's been, uh, we do have a couple examples of where it's led to the recovery and, uh, now some survivors. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it is definitely making an impact. As you see, call to action. Uh, thank God what saved me was that trucker. Because he simply made a phone call. So, any, anybody on the webinar that might have, uh, drivers and want some of this, want training, uh, reach out to more vehicle enforcement and you know, be, be happy to do that. So, make a call, spread the word. And again, there's the, uh, trucker to trafficking email and the 188 number. So, real quick, we always have traffic stops. Why me? Well, what generates one? Obviously, any known or observed violation, probable cause stops, speed, seatbelt, phone, vehicle equipment. Um, number two, officer experience. Violation is based on experience. Overweight vehicles, observed vehicle condition, strange dirt location, direction of travel. You know, on my lie, we've been seeing a lot of oversized loads, and somebody was talking about earlier. People not getting permits and you know, not getting county permits when required. So that's something that, you know, we know that stuff. We're going to stop and check it out. Vehicle users could be a random selection to the officer's assignment. And that's true. Sometimes the, you tell the feds, hey, we're going to do so many special checks or do this or that. And so that's what we do. Go out and stop trucks. So what do we need to do our job so you can get back to yours? Um, as you can see on here, CDL, med card, registration, insurance, blood work, annual inspection, so many papers, if documents, you know, have all this stuff ready. And, and you know, a lot of times people have a binder or a book. And honestly, that still is kind of the best way to do it. Uh, there's a few items that we will take electronically and legally can do that. It's not a problem. It, but it's still simple uh, and even easier just to have it all right there and up to date. And don't be afraid to look at the old and expired ones and get rid of them um, instead of digging through and digging through and digging through. Um, just, we still see that a lot. Nah, it's not, I understand that. People worry about throwing the wrong thing away here and there, but just look at them and make sure you got the right one. So, common issues, violations of counter before, or during traffic stop, out of day paperwork, uh, knowing the location of paperwork and equipment. That's what I mean, knowing where you're at, where your stuff's at. Stopping the vehicle in a safe location for both officer and driver. Uh, Seatbelts, phone use, lighting devices, load steering, attitude, positive attitude helps both of us. And that is very true. Um, easier said than done. I get it. Nobody wants to see us. Nobody wants to be stopped by us. Um, but understand, at the end of the day, we're out there, uh, doing, just doing our job. Um, you know, and for a lot of, most of Iowa, you know, there's a lot, nobody else is, is checking these vehicles. Um, your city cops, your uh, deputies, uh, there's very few state troopers that are uh, trained in commercial vehicle rules and regulations. And obviously motor vehicle enforcement is the only one really that pertains to size and weight. So, you know, we're, we're out there just doing what we're supposed to be doing. And, and one of the biggest things that we do is protect the taxpayers' infrastructure, our infrastructure, because we're all taxpayers. So, you know, people don't think of it that way. Well, then the next time you're going over to a uh, stretch of road that's just beating the heck out of you, remember that that's why we do size and weight checks. That's, you know, that's why we're out here. 
Um, I can't state that enough. Some of you might also follow us on social media, Twitter and Facebook. Uh, so uh, we've had some pretty interesting things posted on our Facebook page lately. Uh, some pictures of stops we found. Uh, so if you haven't followed that, uh, be sure to do. It's, uh, it, it's kind of interesting, some of the things we, we find they come across and uh, share to the public. Our website, uh, iowadut.gov slash mbe. So as you can see, I think you can go to that one. There's a few different things that you can get on that, to that website. Early on, we talked about the uh, truck information guide, which is actually... It's trying to hide it. It's actually this book, but it's the electronic version is available online. You can even Google it, and it'll it'll come up. There's a lot of good information on that in that book. Hey, and look at if somebody wants to wants to possibly wants a job with us, there it is. The Facebook page, the employment opportunities. Um, they started adding that slide there too. I think it's kind of funny, especially coming from me, because in 2009, uh, I went from driving a truck to sitting where I am today talking to you. So, kind of cool. And there's, right there it is. I forgot it was on that black page. I just thought it was just the top one arrow, but it's the, the middle one there. So, other forms. That cues, all that stuff is right there. And I think two more slides. Contact us if you have questions. Uh, that is that is a good one. If you have a question, a lot of times the captain or sergeant in your area, if you picked on the correct color there of whatever area you're in, you can send a generic email, attach your name, uh, phone number. And if you just need something for us, somebody to email you back, we'll email you back. If you would like a phone call and talk to somebody, um, suggest that, and we can we will do that as well. If if we need to, if we can't answer it through an email, so that's the the contact us if you have questions later or uh, something comes up that you'd like more clarification on. There's the website. So any questions? And Mark, I'm going to unshare this screen and let you join us. Well, thank you very much, Sergeant Arbogast. It's been a pleasure today. We've got a lot of information out of you there, uh, especially for me on that load securement. Um, uh, some points that you covered there of how to tie things and what the straps can hold and what the chains can hold. Yeah. So I appreciate everything. I appreciate you joining us. And uh, hopefully we can get back together in the future, maybe on some different topics and Sounds see how it goes. Be safe out there on the road with your job, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today, and uh, thanks for joining Sadler Powertrain. Thank you. Have a good day.